um, this morning is March 29th. It's 2009. We are surrounded by good things, and our message this morning is Puddle Pirates and Seasoned Sailors. If you have turned with me to Psalm 107, yeah, I like long, obnoxious titles. Uh, Puddle Pirates, Seasoned Sailors, please tell me when you're in Psalm 107. Anybody in the room ever been on a cruise? Yes. You can raise your hand if you've been on a cruise. Wow, I feel very fortunate because, oh yeah, I know, mom doesn't like to raise her hand, which means I will be calling on you for the rest of the day. Did uh, I see how Usto picked her out the other yeah, day? He said, you yeah. young lady, he didn't know he was messing with fire there. Uh, cruise ships are big, enormous things. One of the things that is amazing when you get on one is uh, just how big it is. I mean, it's overwhelming. How silly would it seem to find a carnival cruise ship in a little pond? I mean, with a couple feet of water around it. I mean, that's not what they're built for, is it? And, and it ought to seem equally silly, but, but brave, when you see somebody in something that looks like a canoe attempting to cross an ocean, right? That's not what it was designed for. I found out in Christianity a lot of us are missing our design. Like the cruise ships were ever being equipped, ever, ever, ever gaining new insight, new this, new that, from meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting, to meeting without ever doing what we were designed to do. So the whole emphasis of our ministry has been summed up and by seeing lives change in the plaque above the door. Perform out there what you've practiced in here. But when I opened the Psalm 107 this week, I was helping another pastor with his message. And as I looked at it, I saw something that I thought was a unique twist. And uh, I wanted to share it with you. So in Psalm 107, we're going to start in the first verse. Is that okay? Yes. It's already kind of quiet, you know. We're trying to fill the room with lots of different kind of people because you white people are so quiet, it bothers me. It's an eerie silence in the room. It's like, oh. John's like a Vietnamese metronome. He can clap on beat and everything. If I stand near him, I can almost sing. Okay, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. Well, that's an understatement. His love endures forever. How long? Forever. forever. Have you ever been to a place in your life where you thought, okay, well, I know the Lord loves me, but... There is no but. The Lord's love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say this. How about that? Let the redeemed of the Lord say this. This, and then he tells us what to say. Those he redeemed from the hand of the foe. Those he gathered from the lands, from the east and west, from the north and the south. As I began to think about the redeemed, it occurred to me that we're a special group of people. To redeem something is to purchase it. To purchase is to buy, to make it your own. It's your very own possession. With what were you redeemed? It was not with silver or gold. It was not with anything that can perish. It was with a very limited supply of something. A man's very own blood. The most precious substance that the universe has ever known. And it was poured out for us. You know what somebody thinks about something based on what they'll spend on it. You know? Ladies, if your man walks up to you with an engagement ring and he got it from a Cracker Jack box, it might bother you. Now you try to act like it didn't because you don't want to be superficial. But the truth is, somewhere in your mind, you're thinking, is that all they thinks of me? Right? If somebody invites you to dinner and serves you a green bean, <laughs> a singular green bean, thinking, where's the rest of the meal, right? God went the entire nine yards with you. He spent all he could possibly spend mm -hmm. upon you to show you a sense of worth. So that those that had had this spent upon them, the Bible says, lavished upon them, would forever have the perspective that they were special, that they were loved, that they were valued. I want you to understand something. You're going to keep a finger in Psalm because you're going to be in Psalm the whole rest of the day, or at least the time that I have you. But now we're going to go to Daniel 2. While I was on the mission field here the other day, I began thinking about some pretty serious concrete work. I mean... Uh, this stuff was so hard it was special. And uh, you know the scripture in Romans that says, do not conform any longer to the image of this world or the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
To get our minds renewed, what we're doing is we're having our minds reinstated to the, like reformatting the hard drive. You're wiping away all of the corruption that has uh, found its way in and perforated your mind. And you are reestablishing your right understanding of God. Well, here's something that I want you to factor in from here on out. It comes from Daniel 2. And I'm in Deuteronomy 2, but I'm going to get to Daniel 2 right now. It comes from Daniel 2, and it has to do with the four kingdoms that would rule the earth. In all of human history, there have only been, according to the Bible, four Gentile kingdoms that ruled the entire world. Now, some were big fish in little ponds. They, they ruled the immediate area around them, but not the known world. And the first of the Gentile kingdoms that would rule the world was Babylon. And the time in which this prophecy is written, Babylon is considered to be a head of gold, preeminent among all the empires of the world. How do empires usually rule? Do they send out little Valentine's Day cards and ask you to be their subjects? No. Now, how do they rule? You can speak to me. Armies. Military force. And Babylon was the first to exercise its force in the corners of the globe. To go off, bring people captive back to Babylon and force princes to become eunuchs, servants in the palace. Babylon was something else. After Babylon came Medo-Persia. And Medo-Persia had a vast empire that did amazing things, but what they are best known for is military force. And after Medo-Persia came Greece. And in Alexander the Great's lifetime, he conquered the known world. And what he's most known for is his military force. And when you close your eyes and you think of the fourth kingdom, when you think of Rome, when you close your eyes and think of Rome, it's probably not a road or an aqueduct that you think of, but you probably envision a soldier. Because their vast empires went out and they conquered and subdued and subjugated people. But this prophecy that was given to Daniel said something that just began to stir in my soul while we were on the mission field. A great statue, Norman. Okay, in verse uh, 44, this prophecy has just been given about the statue that starts with the head and goes all the way down to the toes. They all represent four Gentile kingdoms. And in verse 44, it says, In the time of those kings, the kings ranging from Babylon all the way down to Rome, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed nor will it be left to another people. As great as Babylon was, it was destroyed and left to another people. As great as Medo-Persia was, it was destroyed and left to another people. As great as Alexander the Great was, his kingdom was destroyed and left to another people. But God said that there would be a kingdom, a king's dominion, that would be set up in the time of those other kings, somewhere in there throughout that time span, that would never be destroyed or left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end. All of man's empire building, all of the military force that subjects the peoples of the world to one monopoly on power would eventually come to an end. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain but not by human hands. A rock that broke iron and bronze. The clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and the interpretation is trustworthy. I want you to understand that when God redeemed you, He put you in something. Something that the Bible calls a rock. A rock cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands. This rock fills the entire planet with its presence. He put you inside of that. You ever play the game when you're a kid, rock, paper, scissors? What a ridiculous, ludicrous game. In what lifetime is paper ever stronger than a rock? Right? But my kids tell me that the paper wraps up the rock. I don't know. You have to be a child to reason like that. Rock is not normally stronger than iron. Not normally stronger than these metals. But God is saying that what He has put in you is stronger than every kingdom that has ever ruled the planet or ever will rule the planet that they will all pass away but you by God's love will endure forever. Saints, God calls you 
indestructible. Yeah. Now you may be in a body that looks like it's wearing out, but what is in you cannot spoil fade, cannot wear out, and we need to understand something. We need to begin to see who we are in Christ. I spent the evening with Abel and Oneida last night, and I love it because this is one of Abel's favorite themes. He likes to talk about who he is in Christ, which is exciting to me. Yes. Pastor, I used to have said, you're more dangerous than a GI with an M16 to the enemy. Usto said the other week, I don't know whether you caught him, I am the Christian the devil's mama warned him about. Hmm. See, the thing is, is when we begin to understand that we don't have to worry about being hurt. Yes. We don't have to worry about not having what it takes to finish the task. <laughs> that we are the thing that crushes every other kingdom on the earth. You ought to walk with a little step taller. Yes. You ought to tilt your face towards heaven instead of away from it. You ought to see yourself as something redeemed, precious for a reason. Turn with me then to the book of Exodus. Yes. You will be in Exodus 15. Come on, it's almost like somebody didn't just tell you you can't be destroyed. It's almost like somebody didn't just tell you that the most expensive thing that the world has ever known was spent on your behalf. How can we sit there in silence just going, mm hmm, mm hmm, yeah? When somebody just spent a Lamborghini times a billion upon you. When somebody has told you that the Kevlar is not what protects you, the living God is what protects you, you can't be destroyed. Now tell me something. I know what it was like. My sister once beat up five boys at a swimming pool on my behalf. The next time I went to that swimming pool, you know what? Little bitty scrawny weakling Eric walked like a man. You want some? Yes. How about you? I'm telling you, you can't be destroyed. Your big brother is the Christ. And you are in the Christ. You don't have to ask him to help on your behalf. You are his hands and feet. When he wants to deliver a blow to the enemy, he uses you to do it. Yes. This is why he takes somebody like David and knocks down Goliath. Yes. This is why he can drown all of Pharaoh's army, the military power of the world, with their tanks, their chariots, with the staff of a shepherd. See, what I'm saying is that he redeemed you and he made you like his war club. But we act sometimes like a San Francisco fan. <laughs> oh, don't hurt me. Can we make peace? Please, I won't bother you. You don't bother me. We'll hide over here in church. Is everything okay? I'm telling you that when you start to realize who you are. Yes. A pastor one time told Matthew, don't, don't mention demons, that scares me. He did the right thing. He got up and walked right out of that church and went somewhere that taught him that demons fear him. That's and he called me and told me about it and I went to... <laughs> I want you to hear how this is said. Israel at their birth, I mean they were birthed through the Red Sea. They came out and they are ready for life. The Bible says that they were armed for battle yes. when they came out of Israel, out of Egypt. Listen to this song that is written about them. It's in uh, Exodus 15 starting in 13. In your unfailing love, unfailing love you will lead the people you have redeemed you don't spend that much money on something that never washed the car you don't go pay six figures for a Mercedes and then never give it a car wash or a vacuum you spend six figures on it you better pay somebody to do that but you can tell what somebody thinks about something by the time they invest in it I love you, honey. I really do. I'm going to be gone this month and next month and when I see you, have dinner on the table. But I do. I, I do care about you. Right. Right. Care more about deer hunting than your wife and then wonder where the problem came in. Try to rebuke that spirit. I promise it won't work. You, you cannot rebuke a spirit from something that is caused by your own bad choices. Mm -hmm. That's, that is a charismatic cop-out. Yes. God purchased us. Yes. He cares about us. In your strength, you will guide them to your holy dwelling. In what? You are led, you are guided in God's strength. If you're from South Louisiana, it's strength! Strength! 
God guides you in strength. Yes. Well, how is it that we can walk around tiptoeing through the tulips then? Is God leading you in strength in your life? Are you confident about the direction and you have the idea, I'm going? That poster back there says Jesus set out resolutely for Jerusalem. There's no word for resolutely. In Hebrew it says he set his face like flint towards Jerusalem. He was led in God's strength and so he would not be moved. God was leading him and he was in that flow of strength. Jesus as a human being probably could not bench press as much as some of you in the room. Might not be able to outrun some of you in the room. Others he probably could outrun. <laughs> but you know what? He flowed in God's strength yes. as an anointed man. Yes. We have to learn about our high calling so that we can flow in His strength. That's it. The nations will hear and tremble. Nations is goyim. This is people groups. The people groups around you, when you are led in God's strength, look and their knees begin to knock together because they know this dude is not just natural. He is above that. He is super natural. And they begin to get frightened. You know why they begin to get frightened? Because Truthfully, Ephesians 2 teaches that lost people are little more than a puppet on the devil's strings. You're either led by a spirit that leads you to righteousness, or you are led by a spirit that dominates your life in disobedience. As Bob Dylan said during a few good years in his life, you will have to serve somebody. That's right. The truth is, you need to decide which you want to serve. Yes. But if you're going to commit, like Elijah told Israel or Joshua told Israel, pick your side and serve Him wholeheartedly. Yes. Because He called a people to walk in strength. He called us to walk in power. Not wear His name and act less than you were called to be. Yes. See, when pastors don't know what else to say, we just say something different. The nations will hear and tremble. Anguish will grip the people of Philistia. Anguish. You mean you following Jesus will cause the enemies of Jesus to be gripped with anguish? If you do it right, it will. What do you think the nations around thought when they saw Egypt's armies drowned in the same sea that delivered Israel? What do you think they thought? I bet they were scared to death, huh? Mm -hmm. Probably changing some tunics. <laughs> the chiefs of Edom will be terrified. The leaders of Moab will be seized with trembling. The people of Canaan will melt away. Terror and dread will fall upon them. By the power of your arm, they will be still as a stone. Who is God's arm? God brought Israel right out of Egypt, didn't He? Yeah. Whose hand did he use? Who stretched out their hand over the waters and saw it split? Moses. Yeah. God healed Tabitha in the book of Acts, right? But he had somebody there as his hand praying for her. Like the name Tabitha is better than the alternative. The other translation is Dorcas. I don't know what that means. God reaches down into human beings yes. as if a man were reaching his hand into a glove and he fills them with his strength and his power. Looks like a man, smells like a man, but it acts like God. Yes. You have to decide. You have to decide whether you want to be led in his strength. You have to decide whether or not you want to be the kind of Christian that the devil laughs at mm. or the kind of Christian that he runs That's right. from. I can tell you I have been both many times in my life. And I found out something. I would a whole lot rather do the chasing than get chased. Yes. I'm the kind of man that would rather deliver a shot than receive one. Mm -hmm. The way that this happens is when you begin to see who you are in Christ and move in the direction He's called you. But, right. said, but I don't know what to do. I guarantee you, you know at least one thing to do. I guarantee you, you know at least one thing. But I don't know what country, what city, I don't know what people. No, no, let's start smaller. Tomorrow, when I wake up, what will I do differently than I did today? That's right. Tomorrow. That's right. And if you put a sign beside your bed that says, Tomorrow I will do this, it will always say tomorrow. Right. Decide and act, saints. Decide and act. 
sometimes we are that carnival cruise ship that has never left the dock. Just you give me more. Load me up. Load me up. Load me up. You're gonna sink. You're gonna sink. You're gonna sink. You're gonna sink because that stuff was meant to be consumed. Yes. By the power of your arm, they will be as still as a stone until your people pass by, O Lord, and until the people you bought pass by. I am bought by God. Yeah. Next time your wife is standing there looking in the mirror talking about imperfections, the next time your husband says he's not valued at work, the next time you are whining and complaining about your imperfections, you need to understand something. You're calling into question God's judgment because He bought you. Yes. How do you feel when you bought a car? You show up to tell your friends and they say, yeah, I don't like the color. Uh, you couldn't buy a full-size truck? You know, uh, You know those don't, I mean, you're going to need that warranty. How does that feel to you? Don't you feel a bit assaulted? Yes. What do you think God feels like when the people that He paid the most for don't even see themselves as somebody. Mm. You find out who you are, a lot of problems will begin to dissipate from your life because the devil will find an easier target. Yes. I am not a Christian that rebukes darkness if you can throw a light switch. I'm not. I mean, if I get a headache, I take Tylenol. It's a very spiritual cure. But I want you to understand this. Some of the sicknesses, some of the frustrations, some of the problems that are in our life are in our life because we don't know that we can do anything about it. Sure. So if you've taken the Tylenol and it didn't work, get out the anointing oil. That's right. If you've done your best to negotiate your raise and it's not working, take it to a higher power. Yes. Saints, we need to remember who we are. Yes. And all of your learning and all of your wisdom, don't reason out God. That's right. You will bring them in and plant them on the mountain of your inheritance. The place, O Lord, you made for your dwelling. The sanctuary, O Lord, your hands established. The Lord will reign forever and ever. I am where God has called me to be, and I will not be moved by the powers of hell or men moved by them. When God sets your direction, nothing should back you up. When God sets your direction, you should flow. I'm so glad you're here, sweetheart. Have a seat by Matthew. We missed you. When God sets your direction, you ought to be an unstoppable force for Him. Go back to Psalm 107. You are the redeemed. From here on out, I don't want to hear the redeemed as, Oh, we're just the little blood bought Christians. Sinner saved by grace. No, you are the people that the nations of the world should fear. Because you will bring their kingdoms to an end. You will establish the kingdom of God everywhere you go. You will take up Adam's mission and the second Adam's goal. You will bring the powers on this earth into subjugation to God's authority. And you do it by refusing to get angry when they're angry. You do it by refusing to stop loving those they say that are unlovable. You do it by refusing to consider something God forsaken that He has told you to care about its sake. You do it by being immovable. The way that Romans says it is you refuse to conform to the pattern of this world. By definition, you're rebellious. By definition, you are nonconformist. By definition, you are throwing off this world's System in favor of a better heavenly order which you consider yourself already a citizen of. Don't you let the world tame you yes. and pull your canines. I know, we're sheep. We're not supposed to have them. Lions have them. Ooh. They don't call them canines. They ought to call them lions. But they got great big ones. I watched one eat a water buffalo yesterday. Mm. <laughs> Psalm 107. Give thanks to the Lord for He is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say this. Those redeemed from the hand of the foe. Those He gathered from the lands, from the east, the west, from the north, and the south. He traveled great distance. How far is the east from the west? Long way. Not a long way. Yes. I think they meet somewhere in Bunky, Louisiana. <laughs> How far is the north from the south? Long way. How far are the highest heavens from the dwelling of men? And He spanned the distance for your benefit. Where were you when He found you? What were you like when you got saved? Look at the wonder here. Verse 4. 
Some wandered in the desert wastelands, finding no way to a city where they could settle. Aimless, not plugged into a living, breathing organism, not somebody plugged into a local fellowship, understanding how you serve and how you are benefited by, not knowing like a wanderer. In the ancient world, if you had no access to a city and you were wandering, that was just another way to say you're about to die. You got off of the trade routes, you got off of the main highways, and you did not survive. The same thing is true spiritually. This is why it is a bad idea for Christians to wander from church to church to church. There is a city you are supposed to settle in, period. Every city has a butcher. Every city has a plumber. Every city has an undertaker. Every city has a mayor. There are God-ordained positions. You better figure out what yours is. They were hungry and thirsty, and their lives ebbed away. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and He delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way to a city where they could settle. Let them give thanks to the Lord for His unfailing love and for His wonderful deeds for men. For He satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. Keep your finger here. Turn with me to Matthew 18. You're going to turn lots of places today. i got 30 more minutes to cram all of the word that I possibly can right down your throat. Bring it on. Matthew 18, verse 1. Pick up with me in verse 12. What do you think if a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away? Wandering. Wandering aimlessly. Wherever you want to go, whatever you want to do, whatever seems right to you, Will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he is happier about that one sheep than about the ninety-nine that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. Our God went through great extent to make sure that you did not perish. You were wondering when He found you. And now He is teaching you a better way. A way that the Bible calls straight. Turn with me to Colossians 1. Pages ought to be turning. Colossians 1. Mandy, why are you not there, there. yet? There, there we go. See? I know. I know. She didn't get enough sleep last night. There. Colossians 1. Starting in verse 10. There. There, there. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power. How much power? All, all power. My microwave has ten different power settings. You know which one I use? All. all. <laughs> I hit the one that is just the highest every time be cooking just a little bitty piece of something. Not usually though. <laughs> and I'm going to use the highest setting every time. You know what? Our God is the same way. He didn't pour a little bit of power into you. He strengthened you with oh. all power. Wow. I got a laptop that has an extended battery. Big ugly thing. Sticks out. It really ruins the whole view of the laptop. I mean it's a beautiful sleek ergonomic looking thing until you put this giant fat battery on it battery lasts about three and a half hours. That's why I bought it. Every once in a while I forget that that battery is charged and I plug it in and I stay this far from the outlet the whole time because I don't know that I've been empowered to go anywhere I want, mm. do anything I want to do as long as it fits within the design of the thing. Mm. Christians are the same way all of the time. The devil's got you on a leash. You can only go this far and no further. You can come out of Egypt but leave your wives and kids behind. You can come out of Egypt but leave your livestock behind. Moses looked that devil right in the eye and said, I will not leave a hoof behind. Mm -hmm. Saints, so somewhere, sometime, we need to recognize I was a wandering sheep, but God has strengthened me with all power. I'm not made to receive a hit from the enemy. I was made to deliver it. Yes. When we begin to think like this, opportunity will arise. You say, Eric, you're talking about a militant Christianity. Say, what did you think you joined? Yeah. Do you think that you can make peace with the very thing that wants to kill you, steal from you, destroy you? 
Appeasement does not work in the spiritual realms. You can look the other way and act like it's not happening and your life will ebb away. You will always be sick. You will always be hungry. You will always be unsatisfied. You will always be less than what God called you to be. But when you follow Him in strength, strengthened with His power, having the idea that nobody is going to take your spiritual lunch money, That's right. all of a sudden something begins to happen. And you know what? You don't have to be physically vigorous for this. You can have no arms and legs and whip every devil that was ever sent at you. Because it's his strength that works in you. Colossians. All power. According to the, his glorious might so that you may have great endurance. Great endurance. You don't ever see that phrase in America. Great endurance unless it's on the deodorant. You know? <laughs> <laughs> this this special new improved whatever that is the same nasty white chalky mess that everyone has made it'll endure the whole day long and then they show you some person who's never sweat in their life you know raise their arms and look how beautiful <laughs> great endurance in the biblical world was a city is under siege but you will not wear out mm -hmm. great endurance in the biblical world is the wolves are all outside the sheep pen but they're not getting in here. Great endurance in the biblical world is Hezekiah looks at Sennacherib and says, my God will deal with you. And an angel runs through the camp and kills 185,000 men on your behalf. Great endurance is something we don't see because we don't allow ourselves to get into great tribulation. We've informed every doctrine we can think of to protect us from the great tribulation. Great trouble means great deliverance. Great trouble means a great salvation. This power that is in you is supposed to produce great endurance. Here's the word that's dirty. And patience. <laughs> and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. He didn't just find you wandering. He rescued you from your wandering. Yes. He didn't just say, all right, here's the way, walk in it. He brought you into the dominion of His Son so that you could walk in light all the rest of your life. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And He is the head of the body, the church. So all those things we said about Him, He's the head and you are the body. What does that mean about you? Do you describe, would Gabe describe his chest in different terms than he would describe the rest of his body? Yes, it's glowing and it's rippled. <laughs> would he describe his hand as something foreign to his body? No. All of those things that Jesus is, you are in Jesus. Yes. For God was pleased to have all His fullness dwell in Him. Mm. But what is the Him? That is His body of which He is the head and it dwells in all of us mm. collectively. His body. And through Him to reconcile to Himself all things. Yes, Jesus did all the work to reconcile all things to Him. How is it being accomplished? Through you. You are made an ambassador preaching a message of reconciliation. Whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through His blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated, a wanderer, from God and enemies in your own minds because of your evil behavior. But now He has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in His sight, without blemish and free from accusation. Yes. There is no accuser before the Father day and night. That's right. He is not there. He has been cast down. There is no one making accusations, so why do you take up His job and accuse yourself and your thoughts daily? Why do you do it? Why do you say, I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not holy enough, when the Word says that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? Yes. Without accusation, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, not move from the gospel, hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard, and it goes on and on to say, of which he is a servant. The beatitude. 
Blessed are the hung those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be... God took you from wandering. He rescued you. He brought you into His fold. He's made you to be like Him, showing you to walk in a straight way, and now He wants something from you. He wants you to desire a diet of the right kind of food. Yes. If you hunger and thirst for righteousness, you will be filled. filled. If you don't think you are righteous enough, change your diet. Right. The Bible says you're credited with righteousness and then tells you to walk in it. That's a little bit like saying the house is yours, now each month make a payment. There is no work which would earn you righteousness. God gave it to you. Yes. Amen. But He requires that you hunger for it daily. And then He fills you with it. Now, I was told not to be theatrical. That's hard for me. I'm very tempted to have you all repeat after me, but we're not going to do it. I am righteous. Oh, it's hard to say, isn't it? Yeah. Because you know you're not. But is not faith calling the things that are right. not as though they were? Yes. You didn't ask me how I was righteous. Yes. You know, I am righteous. Liar! No, I'm not lying. You just don't understand how I'm righteous. Yeah. See, I'm in my big brother and he did it perfect. And by the way, you don't like it? Watch this. His foot's coming down on your head. Watch down. <laughs> he, he's the kind that stomps on his. You can nibble at his heel if you want, but he is stomping on your head. You like that? You want some more? <laughs> This needs to be our attitude. Yes. When did we become the ones trampled upon? Yes. Right. He said, I gave you authority to trample on the enemy. That's right. He didn't say, you go be a doormat. You know who you're a doormat for? Your brothers and sisters in Christ. You let them clean their feet on you. You let them practice on you. You let them learn and grow by bumping into you, being ugly to you, doing all of those things. You know who you don't let push you around? The devil. Yes. Back to Psalm 107. Wanderers. Let's move on to those who are oppressed. Those who need gates to be broken and chains to be liberated. Some sat in darkness. This is Psalm 107 verse 10. Some sat in darkness. The first kind were those who wandered. The second kind are those who are sitting in darkness. Some sat in darkness and the deepest of gloom. Prisoners suffering in iron chains. Why iron? Because in this day, it was the unbreakable metal. Iron and bronze or brass, copper mixed with tin were the metal du jour. For they had rebelled against the words of God and despised the counsel of the Most High. So He subjected them to bitter labor. They stumbled and there was no one to help. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and He saved them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness and the deepest gloom and broke away their chains. Yes. Let them give thanks to the Lord for His unfailing love and His wonderful deeds for men. For He breaks down gates of bronze and cuts through bars of iron. iron. What were those kingdoms of the world made of that the rock crushed? Bronze. That's right, there was bronze and iron in there. Our God working in us will break your every addiction if yes. you give Him the opportunity. So I don't have any addiction. I have never been in AA. I have never been blah, blah, blah. Oh no, there is a sinful addiction in all human beings. That's it. And He will break it yes. if you give Him half the chance. Mm. But you know from dealing with some that have very obvious addictions, not everybody wants to be free. Mm. Some would rather just hide what they do because they like it. Mm. You get honest before your God and what He has put in you will break open gates that have bound you your whole life. All you have to do is give Him half of a chance and He will take it. In Luke 4, actually, let me just quote you this. Matthew 4, it would be Matthew 4, 12 through 17, says, the people in darkness have seen a great light. He's quoting the prophets. And this is during the time Jesus is born in the Galilee. Galilee of the Gentiles. The reason that it's being quoted is because now people who have sat in darkness and gloom for the first time begin to see light. They begin to see hope. Jesus then goes into a synagogue in Luke 4.16 and He picks up a scroll and He says, I'm going to read to you. And He reads to them from Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61 speaks about the favorable year of the Lord setting prisoners free. Those bound in dungeons and darkness getting set 
free. Everything about Jesus' ministry was aimed at something. Going to take those who wandered, put them on a narrow, straight way, filling them with righteousness, breaking off of them every chain, that every limitation that there had ever been, breaking open gates for them that had held them back. Showing people who had been surrounded by darkness a better way. Saying you can be favored rather than scorned. Saints, you say, well, which am I? Was I the wanderer or was I the one that was chained? How could you not be both if you're honest? How could you not be both? Daniel 2 says that the king's dominion in you would crush all the kingdoms of the world. What are you letting reign in your life? What's there that does not have to be there? And then, why have you not said it before the king? Say, well, I have. I have said it before the king. It's just not going away. Well, then we need to decide something. Is God failing or are you failing? You want to take a bet on that? Anybody? See, I had to put myself in a situation where I said, "Mm." I keep asking the Lord for help in this and I don't seem to be receiving help in this. Is the problem with God or is the problem with me? Oh, I'm sorry, Lord. I didn't realize that as much as I wanted to be free from it, really what I wanted to be free was the negative consequences. I kind of liked it, really. And I learned to hate that chain. And you know what? It fell off of me. It is the mercy of God. His strength, His power works in us. Why don't we move on then? We've covered the wonder. We've covered those who are oppressed and freed. Perhaps we are to cover the foolish ways. Start with me in verse 17. Some became fools. How do you become a fool? You had to be something other than a fool to start with, right? To become a fool, you had to be something else or it would just say some were fools. But it says some became fools. In addition to those who were wandering and the Lord saved us, in addition to those who were chained and the Lord freed us, some of us after being freed from our chains, after being rescued from the dominion of darkness and set free from our wandering and plugged into a church, find it hard to just stick with God. And we become foolish in our thinking. Some became fools through their rebellious ways and suffered affliction because of their iniquities. One of my favorite things that happens, I say that with the utmost sarcasm. If you can't detect it, I'm telling you. I cannot inject any more sarcasm into that statement through tone or inflection. Is to watch people make incredibly horrible choices and then a month later forget they made those choices, reap the consequence, and go, why is God doing this to me? I served Him and loved Him all my life. Yeah, except last month and two months before that and five months before that. Mm. Who is He talking about? I'm talking about every one of you and I'm talking about me. I'm talking about anybody else that has ever forgotten the goodness of God to go do what they wanted to do for a while. Mm. They loathed all food and drew near the gates of death. What kind of food can you loathe when you're in church? Mm. It's coming right now. Some of you like it, some of you don't. It's coming right now. You're receiving a meal. But when you begin to loathe correction and encouragement and instruction, and you say, I just want to do what I want to do! You're closer to the gates of death than you know. Now you may not see it presented like that as often as I get to. What you hear is, it was just time to move on. We have all played the fool at times. It's interesting. Proverbs 12, 15 says that all the fool's ways seems right to him. Mm-hmm. All of them do. Fool, I'm not sure you should have turned right back there. Nope, it was right. <laughs> fool, you seem to be headed for a ditch. Nope, it's right. Huh. Fool, I, I, it looks like where you're headed is death. Nope, seems right. Not a surprise because not just fools, but Proverbs 14, 12 says there's a way that seems right to a man. And in the end, it leads to destruction. When we rebel against what God has said, I'm not talking about what you think He might have said, what He inferred, but what His Word actually says. Do this, don't do this. And you rebel against that. We cannot be surprised that the result is affliction. He sent forth His Word and healed them. He rescued them 
from the grave. If you were a lifeguard and somebody was drowning and you said, reach out your hand, and instead they gave you a one finger salute. And uh, you said, look, look, grab hold of this special flotation device. And instead they turn around and hmm. How much time would you spend trying to save them? After a while you might go, well, do you want to sink? Goodbye. God doesn't do that. His love is unfailing. It endures forever. He loves you when you don't show love for yourself. And you know what He does? He keeps sending His Word in an attempt to rescue you. He keeps sending it, and He keeps sending it, and He keeps sending it, and one day, you snap to Him and go, my God, I'm sinking. Why didn't somebody tell me? And He saves you. Now, this becomes an interesting thing. Colossians 1, 26 through 31, I don't have time to read you. Write it down. Go read it. You have the ability to do that yourself at home. You can do things besides watch American Idol. <laughs> My mom says Seacrest is pretty cute. I don't see it. I don't understand. Uh, Colossians says that you are righteous and holy in Christ. How can you say that about somebody that ignores God's ways and is rebellious and is receiving in themselves the iniquity that is due from their sin? Well, you wouldn't say it, but God did because He purchased you. Does it mean that what you're doing is great? Does it mean that if you keep doing it, that at some point He won't remove His hand from you? But here's what it does mean. It means that there is never a place where it is too late. He's sending forth His Word saying, I know you're dirty. I know you're messed up. But come on, I'm calling you righteous. Yes. I'm calling you righteous. Just don't do that anymore. Come on with me. Come on, come on. Let me lead you in my strength. You weren't made to be trampled on. You were made to do the trampling. Come on. Come with me. Let's go now. Leave your life of sin. Don't worry about those accusers. I dismiss them. You follow me now. And somewhere in that, we have got to stand up and say, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it not just in this area, but that one too. Not just here, but in my finances. Not just there, but in the health in my home. Not just in my home, but in my workplace. Yes. Sometime we got to say, no more wandering. No more rebellion. No more chains. Yes. Devil, they should have warned you about me. I now know who I am in Christ and I was made to step on you. Get out of my way. I was... Uh, I don't have enough time to tell you all the things I was. How about we just skip that? At a point in my life, I was always the smallest kid in class, though. That surprise you? I only ate these little hot dogs. <laughs> that was it. I mean, that's like my whole nourishment. If you wonder whether you can live on an Oscar Mayer, I can assure you for the first five years or so of your life, it can be done. Then I graduated to sausage and A1. My grandmother fixed that. Um, yeah, it was amazing. There was a day about the seventh grade where I outgrew all of those people who had been giving me wedges. I had a glorious few months. I got thrown out of school. <laughs> but I just had a lot of fun there for a little while. Sometime you need to grow up in your salvation and realize you have outgrown those things that were tormenting you. Yes. And what has been giving you hell, you need to send to hell right under your foot. Yes. That's right. Devil's a bully. He'll take advantage of you as long as you will let him. All right. None of that was our message. Isn't that good to know? No. You've experienced all of these things. You've been brought into fellowship out of wandering. You've been freed from oppression. And your backsliding ways have been cured. Not just once, but many times in your life, if you're honest. Yes. Yeah. Man stood up before pulpit one time. I was sitting right about over there in a different church. And he said... I have a virgin testimony. I thought it was a joke. And then he began to tell me how righteous he was. And I looked around to see if anybody in the church was noticing. And there were pictures circulating of his good deeds. Literal pictures. In the first and second row. I don't know anybody that has a virgin testimony. I've met lots of liars in my life. The truth is everybody in here had a jailhouse conversion. Yes. You were chained by something. You were wandering somewhere. And you said, Lord, if you get me out of this, I'll serve you all the days of my life. Yes. If you don't think that was your conversion, you might not yet be converted. We should talk. I do that. <laughs> it's kind of my thing. I like to see lives changed. All of us. 
Now why have you been allowed to go through all of those things? Why did God not just reach down His hand and force you to do things that are right? Well, something happens to us as we gain these experiences. As we start in verse 23, others, others, there's always this group and then the others. Others went out on the sea in ships. Amazing thing about these ships. Seas in the Bible have to do, and I thought I'd have time to teach you and I don't, with humanity. The seas of humanity the Bible speaks about. It talks about God's knowledge covering the whole earth and it's speaking about the people on the earth like water covers the seas. It speaks of seas of people coming against Jerusalem and armies. Others went out in ships on the seas. See, when you know what it is like to have wandered and been found, when you know what it is like to be oppressed, and then freed. When you know what it is like to have played the fool, and now you know better, it is time to go out on the sea of humanity. It is time to go find others that are wandering, who are oppressed, yeah. and who don't yet know how to cure their backsliding ways. Yeah. Others went out on the seas in ships. They were merchants on the mighty waters. Nobody gets in a boat and goes out on the oceans without hoping to return with something. If you're a fisherman, what do you want to bring back? Yes. If you're a treasure hunter, treasure. if you're an explorer, some proof that you've found what you're looking for. But everybody wants to bring something back. They saw the works of Yahweh, His wonderful deeds in the deep. If we never go into the deep, we never see the wonderful deeds. Saints, we can sit here and wonder about how He saved us. We can sit and talk about how He set us free. You can sit and talk about when you backslid and now God's restored you. And there is one resounding question in the heavens. Why? Why did He do all of those things? In Genesis 12, why did God bless Abraham? To be a blessing to others. Why did God save you? You are His hands and feet and He has lots of people He wants save. Are there reasons not to go out into the ocean of humanity? There's storms. Sometimes people crash and sink. Sometimes they get at their literal wits end. Listen to this. They saw the works of the Lord, His wonderful works, His wonderful deeds in the deep. For He spoke and stirred up a tempest that lifted high the waves they mounted up to the heavens and went down to the depths. In their peril, their courage melted away. That sounds like a bad thing, doesn't it? What do we find when we reach the end of your strength? What do we find when we reach the limits of your courage? We have a chance to see God working in you. See, as long as we're protectionist, we sit around and guard what's ours and make sure we don't expend too much and make sure that we're never really threatened. You never find out where you stop and God begins. But when you plunge out into the ship, you go into the unknown and say, come hell or literally high water. Yes. Lord, I want to do your work. Yes. You will see wonderful deeds. Mm -hmm. Amazing things. The kind of things that are people's lives that are completely changed because you in fear and trembling spoke a word to them. How powerful is that? They reeled and staggered like drunken men, and they were at their wits' end. I was sharing with Abel last night my testimony about starting this church. And I got to a place where I was literally in my underwear, face down on the floor, crying before God at my wits' end. I found something wonderful. He spoke to me and gave me a new direction that's just different than what I considered. He said, enclose your garage and put 50 chairs in it which was an interesting thing since the population of our church had just shrunk to about 10. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amazing thing. His wonderful deeds are out in the deep waters. You just have got to be willing to risk something. Yes. They cried out to the Lord in their trouble and He brought them out of their distress. If you've never seen God's strong right hand, maybe you've never needed it. Mm -hmm. Maybe you never put yourself at risk. Mm -hmm. You ever played a sport with somebody 
right? Like you say, hey, come on, <clears throat> let's go play tennis. <laughs> and they show up, and they got on brand new tennis shorts, brand new tennis shirt, no wristband, maybe a <laughs> visor kind of thing, <laughs> a new racket. And they're thinking, wow, either this dude just broke into a tennis store, he's, he's been playing tennis. Then they hit the first shot, and you realize, hunks <laughs> already. <laughs> You just look the part. Mm. Go do that with golf. Well, Christians do that an awful lot. They look like a giant cruise ship, but they don't even get the work done that a tiny canoe on the ocean gets done. Wow. I don't want to be that. In my day, we called those posers. <laughs> Is that word still around, young people? It's a good one, yeah. Hadn't become something dirty, huh? Good. I did good. Then. I did good. Posers. I don't want to be a poser. He stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm and He guided them to their desired haven. Let them give thanks to the Lord for His unfailing love and His wonderful deeds for men. Let them exalt Him in the assembly of the people and praise Him in the council of the elders. When we venture something for God, when we set out to sea on the sea of humanity... When like David in 1 Samuel 17, 20, we load up and set out, giants fall. We see mighty deeds for God. We see things happen. And that even is for another purpose. What do you do with it? You come back to the assemblies of the saints, even the elders, and you say, come on, man, if we can just go, if we can just get excited enough to try something for God, if you just stick a pinky out there, yes. He will do an amazing thing. And most of the time the church says, no, nah, uh-uh, not going to do it. Fine, right here. Mm -hmm. I'm okay, you're okay, leave me alone. Look, I mean, there's no obvious sin in my life. It's all good. You know? Show me how to be blessed. Give me a good, good message on prosperity. Or grace. I like grace even better. Tell me more about grace. Mm -hmm. You were never born to just receive saints. Yes. that make you a puddle pilot. Robbing everything you can from the immediate waters right around you, never growing, never doing anything. And God called you to be a seasoned sailor. He called you to go out and be fishers of men. Jesus was speaking to Peter in Matthew 4.19. He says, come with me and I will make you fishers of men. It's an amazing thing because it seems like he's speaking to Peter, but he says, fishers of men. Yes. He wasn't just speaking to Peter, he was speaking you. Yes. Fishers of men. It's plural. Mm -hmm. Where are the fishers? Where are the fishers for men? What are you risking? What are you putting yourself out there that others might be cured from their wandering, cured from their backsliding, freed from their chains? What are you risking? That's an important question. Because it's kind of like talents that you put at risk to gain an investment. Go read that parable. Tell me what you think about it. Said, but there's trouble and there's distress. Every group that I read you about, every single one, was saved out of their trouble, yes. out of their distress. Right. Where do you expect to find salvation? Right. Yes. It's not in the safe harbor. Right. Saints, you were called to something. Mm -hmm. You were called to be more than mere men. You were called to be something supernatural, <coughs> something that causes the heavenly powers to shake when you walk by. I pray that we reach that calling. Every one of us. I can tell you the truth. It is easy with teenagers. You know that age where young men begin to kind of get full of themselves? They start to notice that their arms are developing, you know, and they pray. It's <laughs> I got born again during that time period. So when my wife was sick and had a fever that could not be cured, we prayed, and we prayed, and we prayed. And I was about to give up, but Suzanne said to keep praying. So we prayed, and we prayed, and I felt something get up out of that room that was like a gorilla. And like a strobe light was flashing, I saw it. And my very first thought was, wow, that's big and powerful. But it only lasted a second because I had been taught who I was in Christ. Yes. And I realized it would be scared of me. And I chased it all the way down the hallway and all the way out of my house. And my wife was better that moment. Mm -hmm. So, well, Eric, you're just a kid. It's a fanciful story. I assure you, it's not about what you've seen. 
It's not about impressive visions or stories. I don't share that stuff very much. It's about learning that you are not to be walked on. You are the one to do the walking and taking authority in your life. Yes. To the extent you do that, you will experience victory. But it's for one purpose. Go teach others to do it as well. Y'all right. stand to your feet. Yes, Caden, that's right. I would covet your prayer on a subject. I'm about to pray for you. I would covet your prayer that we call in the air attack, the bombing campaign, that we soften a man named Scott Pierce's heart about this next week. Okay? He has a certain amount of money that he wants for it. He's a businessman. He should want that. It's right for him to want that. I'm not going to give it to him. But I want the sweet. So that's kind of where we're at. That could be an impasse. But we serve a God who can do something about that. That's right. that's so this week, do something for other people. Spend some time, some knee time in prayer because there are kids in these neighborhoods that lives are going to be changed oh, yeah, that's because right. some uneducated kid from Baton Rouge, Louisiana got born again and wanted to do something with it that's it. and found others who would follow him. Yes. That's right. Saints, our lives have got to be about more than just us. That's that's right. They've got to be. Let's pray. Mighty, mighty God, though we thank you for the chance to be in your service. We thank you, Holy One, that we are the wanderer that you found. We thank You, mighty God, that we are the one that was imprisoned, that has been set free. Yes. We are the one that became fools in our thinking, but found Your mercy anyway. Yes. Now, Lord, I pray. I'm asking that You would compel us in our thoughts, in our deeds, in our actions to set out on the seas of humanity, to see Your wonderful deeds as others are rescued. Yes. Lord, make this church an evangelistic church. Bring the harvest in here that we might disciple. Mighty One, You will get all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength, our attention, our focus poured into them. Yes. But Lord, they have got to be here first. We're asking You for the inheritance that is the nation. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.